Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rebecca Power, uh, Director of the North Central Region Water Network and host for your, uh, your, the current webinar today. Uh, we have, we are privileged to have Steve Keen join us from Purdue University and the Extension Disaster Education Network. The purpose of the current, which is the North Central Region Water Network's speed networking webinar series, is to uh, introduce some of our great extension colleagues uh, and our research colleagues to you uh, in hopes of, of making linkages that uh, produce more effective water research extension and management across the North Central Region. So uh, we will be um, starting here in a few minutes. Uh, normally we have three presenters. Today we have uh, Steve. He's, he's enough for three people. And um, we we'll ask everyone that's joining us to submit their questions for presenters via the chat box. Uh, and we will uh, get to those after Steve's presentation, which uh, will be between 30 and 40 minutes or so. Um, we have a relatively light attendance today, so uh, we may just go ahead and ask you um, to use your talk button and, and be able to ask, uh, ask your questions uh, via the, the talk button. Um, so we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. That said, uh, we'll go ahead and, and get started with Steve's presentation. So Steve, if you just want to introduce yourself and go ahead and get started with your presentation. All right. Thank you. Um, and hello to those that are on here live and to those who will join us when it's uh, recorded and uh, distributed that way. I'm going to be talking about the Extension Disaster Education Network, and uh, I am really pleased to be able to talk to this group about partnering with Eden. Um, we are looking at, uh, well, we're working with NIDIS, uh, the drought monitor folks, uh, with climate change centers uh, and all of that to try to see how disaster education fits into this bigger topic that we're all wrestling with now. And uh, we're seeing it in Eden through the um, increased number of events. And I've been in the disaster business since the drought of 88. So I've, I've, and I definitely feel like we are having increasing situations. A little bit more about myself. I'm a Purdue Extension Disaster Specialist since 1988, Eden Homeland Security Project Director, and that is a fund, funded project through USDA NEPA to help Eden produce some of the things I'm going to talk about. And I'm also local. I'm with the uh, West Central Indiana COAD. The COAD is a community organization active in disaster and president of that. And then I'm on the state level, I'm on the Indiana Department of Homeland Security Foundation Board, in which we give about $400,000 away to emergency managers through a unique um, situation where we can donate to this foundation by paying a little bit more for our license plates. And believe it or not, enough people do that we have money to give away each year. Eden started uh, back after 19. 93 when we had the Missouri and you know, uh, Ohio River, Mississippi River flooding. Uh, I, I do remember that, and I remember that it took us three days to use a thing called GREP to get into other universities' computers, and we put together about eight or nine resources that we could give to extension educators out in the counties. And it, after it took the three days to find those resources, we still had to, we, we gathered them here at Purdue and we drove them to points of contact with Missouri, Illinois, Iowa Extension. And so after that was over, we received a CSREES grant, which is now USC NEPA, to see how can we do this better. So Eden officially started in 1994 in a meeting in Kansas City, and it started in the North Central Region, and we were North Central Region for quite a while. In 1997, we began to expand nationally as Louisiana and Oregon joined. And then in 2002, I mentioned the CSREES grant, DHS grant came in, and that helped considerably 
put some teeth into what Eden could do. And by 2005, we were in all states and three territories. And for those of you who are an extension and aware, uh, we do have an Eden e Extension Pioneer Community of Practice. We were one of the original um, e Extension uh, COPs, as they call them. Our mission is extremely simple to reduce the impact of disasters through research-based education. We are, we have gone from FEMA and DHS and others saying, who are you, to they know that that's what our mission is and they appreciate the fact that we bring research-based education. And I think that's another way in which we can tie in uh, with your group. Furthering that uh, mission or backing that mission up, we, we, we're presenting excuse me, interdisciplinary multi-state programs linking uh, federal, state, and local agencies and organizations. We do a lot of work at anticipating future disaster education needs. And again, that's, that's another reason why a partnership here is so critical, so that we can all work together to anticipate the kinds of changes we're going to see. Uh, providing timely communication and information delivery to meet audience needs. Providing credible, reliable information. And that's that last bullet is so crucial to us that um, Extension is a credible partner in, in counties and we, we want to do everything we can to uphold that. Our internal goals, and I apologize to some of you who are not, uh, who are Extension, uh, I'm going into maybe a little bit more detail, internal detail, to explain uh, uh, what Eden is all about. Uh, so our internal goals are to strengthen Extension's capacity and commitment to address disaster issues. And I think we've done a lot of that, but we have a long way to go. We also want to strengthen Eden's capacity to provide research-based disaster education. And we have some specific things I'll mention later that we're working on to do that. Our external goals are to enhance the abilities of individuals, families, organizations, agencies, and businesses to prepare for, prevent, mitigate, and recover from disasters. And you work with disasters, there's, there's actually many phases of disasters, but these are the ones most commonly used, uh, the ones I mentioned here. We want to serve as a national source for research-based educa disaster education. I will talk more about that as we get further into the slides. So who is Eden? And this is an important point that I must stress, that Eden is extension. And it's the land grants and the sea grants that are members. So if you work, at a land grant or seed grant institution, you are your institution is a member of Extension. Eden has delegates at those institutions, and it's the Eden point of contact who adds delegates in that institution. In a little bit, I'll show you uh, where you need to go to to look up your point of contact if you don't know who that is. We're made up of the. 1862 and 1890 land grants, the sea grants, and then uh, we actually have international members. Um, the Philippines liked what Eden was doing so much that they started the, the, uh, Eden in the, for the Philippines, started a Nicole University, and we are looking at um, some partnerships with some Canadian institutions, but that's yet to come. And then, of course, we work very closely with USDA and NEPA. Um, and then they are members of Eden. It's important to note also that Eden is primarily a network. We have 300 dedicated volunteers representing more than 75 areas of expertise. If I have a question about a flood, I get on the um, Eden network and use, use our district, uh, our Eden delegates email group and send out my question, and within minutes, I'm usually getting back some very good resources, either web pages or uh, publications and or very good direct answers uh, to some of my questions. So I was dealing with a really tricky flood issue in Fort Wayne, Indiana, in which the, the, there was some structural issues going on, and I sent an email out to the delegates, and I, I heard back from Missouri and North Dakota with 
with just the answers that the folks were wanting and helping them confirm that they knew what they, they were doing the right thing. We're fortunate to have what we call Eden staff, and it's 1.5 FTEs at Purdue and 0.75 at Louisiana State University. Uh, for a national organization, that's not a lot of staff, so we, we are busy, um, and um, we're focused mostly on coordinating our efforts, coordinating our communications, and our web support. All others in the network are volunteers for Eden. I'll make a distinction on that just a little bit later. And Eden is only as strong as our delegates uh, contribute to make it. And I have to say over the last year, I've seen phenomenal growth since our meeting in, at New Mexico State last year. We, we just met last week at Cornell. And I think you're going to see some really good stuff coming out of, of Eden to help you with community decisions in your area. We have what we call two NEOs. Those are National Eden Issues Leadership, uh, one on flood and one on drought. I happen to be the drought NEO, and I have been working with the drought uh, on a national level since 2012, when 67% of the United States was in drought. Um, I actually was part of the, I might have been the only non-federal person on a national disaster recovery framework for drought. And there's some things I'm going to talk about a little bit later that we developed from, developed from that. Uh, and of course, our flood meal um, is, is operated out of North Dakota State University and did a very good job providing these resources for all of us. We also work within our program aerial work groups. And those of you not familiar with Extension, that's Family and Consumer Science, 4-H and Youth Development, Community and Economic Development, and Agro-Security. I was just working on our budget today and, and uh, put a, a tiny little bit of money into each of those work groups. And uh, as an example, the Community and Economic Development work group last year, we put a little bit of money into them. They've now won two national awards, and the effort that they're dealing with uh, in, in the co-eds that I talked about uh, is, is being referred to in a uh, document supporting some Eden funding that's going to the president. I don't think I have it in the slide, but Eden gets its operating money from the fatty line item in Congress. And the fatty line item in Congress is the Food and Ag Defense Initiative. And 98% of that money goes to the National Plant Diagnostic Network and the National Animal Health Network and even gets 2% of that, which we're thankful to have. I mentioned it before, we work in all the disaster function areas. Uh, and we, again, we use preparedness, prevention, response, recovery, mitigation. And for us, it's all about making the community better prepared. And it could be the ag community, it could be the urban community, but it always it's the whole community that we're striving at, and that's where our, we're all hazard and whole community uh, project leaders. All disasters are local. Um, this was taken at uh, some of the river flooding up in North Dakota, and extension is local, which is the key to why we work. In fact, um, the when a disaster happens, usually the county commissioners expect extension locally to have the answers. And they can't always have all the answers they're needed, that, that they need. And we, even leaders, are there to help them when they need information. Um, we must prepare their families. We help prepare our offices. And there's some, there are some good office planning uh, for disaster programs. They're available through Eden on our website. And we can help prepare our communities. This is the current Eden National website, which is which is uh, going through a change. It's going to look much different about uh, six months from now. But I wanted to point out some items up in the upper right-hand corner. You see the state information with the drop-down menu. If you go there, you will find your point of contacts and who else uh, is a delegate in your state. 
And of course, you can see we have top disaster topics. We have a lot of eating courses. I'm going to highlight those. News and pictures, you can see where some of our conferences and workshops have been in a resource catalog, which will be uh, probably most of value to you. One of the programs, we did the natural security workshop, three of them actually across the country um, in about 2006 or seven, I want to say. And one of the things that we saw that we needed to do was help Extension better understand how to strengthen community agro-security preparedness. And uh, this program was funded through the FATI funds that I mentioned, and it has been used in about 25 states. We have trained trainers who can deliver it. We are adapting this program in Indiana to deliver uh, by our extension districts in Indiana to communities. And, and when we say that, we, we, we want to bring as many from the community together as possible from the health department to law enforcement to the agriculture sector, et cetera. And uh, strengthening community agro security preparedness and planning is a very strong program that we have. And, and if uh, my contact information will be on here. If you want more information about that, let me know. We have online courses that we've developed. Plant biosecurity has been used worldwide. Um, and, uh, we were kind of surprised to get some people from uh, Western Europe taking a look at that. Uh, family preparedness, uh, ready business, those are two programs that we worked with DHS and FEMA nationally to put together. And they're very, very good courses. Uh, the Ready Business uh, prepares. We typically work with smaller business people who've been saying, I, I need to put together a continuity plan. And some of the feedback we get after they've gone through this three hour online course is they now have 75% of the plan put together and we've been trying to do that for several years. So some very good online courses. We're expanding our collaborations. One of the ones that um, isn't on here that we hope will be on here is the Foundation for Food and Ag Research, FAR. Um, they have funding to take a look at types of diseases and what kind of research we're needing when, when a, an outbreak like that happens so that we have better information in the future. I'm not going to read through all the uh, symbols here. We did work with CDC this year to develop a zombie preparedness display at our state fair and it's going to go around to children's museums in the next year. So I'm proposing, um, how about a partnership with you folks and uh, if you'd like to talk more about that, I've got about uh, 18, 19 more slides and we'll be in the question and answer period. So going forward, how, how what might we look at? The Eating Exercise Committee is, develop, is developing and has developed exercises for FEMA's Emergency Management Institute. That's a picture of it. It's in um, uh, Maryland. And this is the, the EMI is where all of the, well, the nation, nationwide responders go to for training. We've now conducted uh, two cultural uh, related uh, exercises and um, we're going to do another one next year. This is a place where, you know, we, our exercise committee could could take a look at what you folks dealing with water issues might want to inform first responders about. We're part, we were part of a, a White House roundtable on preparedness. If you haven't seen it, you might want to Google the uh, the national the 2016 National Disaster Preparedness Report for the president. It shows 37 areas in which we can improve, and many of them had to deal with uh, too much too much water and what we did and didn't do to prepare for that. Uh, we this was the first year we put research into our eating annual meeting, and it was a good start. But we got a lot to grow there, and we're we're trying to bring the uh, researchers and extension together in that method. So. Uh, what can you do? Well, we'd like we'd love for you to share resources in the Eden database or by email. That's if you would become an Eden delegate. Um, encourage educators to work with county emergency management. Learn ICS 
as Incident Command System and NIMS, National Incident Management System, because county educators could possibly have a seat in the Emergency Operations Center. And I've, I've served out of the Emergency Operations Center many a time. Sometimes Extension can be brought in as a expert without all of the Incident Command and National Incident Management training, but we're working to try to increase uh, the Extension's uh, knowledge in this area so that we can do more. Develop institutional uh, communication and continuity plans. As I said, we have examples of those. Develop state and county disaster education teams and programs. And you know, we'd certainly love to be at the table to work with your group if that's something that you're interested in. In 2015, we did a uh, study on agency usefulness. And uh, when I say that NEFA provides us with funds, our survey showed that about uh, the Eden delegates that we have spend between 10 and 50 percent of their time on disaster work. That's a big range. And you can see down below that it, it varies by program area work group, uh, mostly most strong in ag and natural resources, but I think you'll see that the community and economic development will increase. We're, we're making the argument that um, that disaster preparedness is not a cost, it's an economic development. Um, and so with that range, we calculate that the land grant universities and sea grant universities put about $2.8 million into Eden work each year. Um, those that uh, responded, and it was quite a robust response, especially among the extension directors, said that 73% um, Respondents said their state resources are more robust because of Eden. 83% of the delegates responding said Eden saves them time, and I can attest to that. And I don't have to go do a lot of research, um, and, and I can find the resources right on the Eden website or with a simple email out to the group. It saves a lot of time. Um, and the extension directors, as I said, were um, quite robust in responding to the survey. They said it provides access to a network of extension experts. I mentioned that, 75 different areas of expertise. Um, it helps facilitate interstate assistance for disaster response. When a disaster happens, we, Eden leadership, contact the Eden delegate or point of contact in that state and see how we can help. It provides a platform for sharing programming, enhances multi-state programming. I can give you a lot of examples. SCAP is one of those that's a multi-state programming, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel in each state. It lends credibility uh, to state-produced resources, and uh, we're looking at Eden has really only become nationally branded in about the last four years, and so we're looking at ways that that can help, again, uh, lead credibility to state-produced resources. Um, People said they were able to provide high quality, up-to-date, research-based information to our clientele, even if we don't have subject matter experts on specific topics in every county or even in the state. That's impossible to do. And more and more, we're being asked to work across state lines. You guys are working across state lines, and that's that's what this is all about. I don't need to read this whole thing. Um, even resources and networks have been instrumental in getting the co-ed effort uh, on the ground, and I can tell you that co-ed effort has, has saved millions in Indiana alone in terms of disaster recovery. And I, I put this slide in here just to point out that, that Eden has, uh, on our national Eden drought site, uh, which is pretty easy to get to if you go to our, you get the link there, but also you can go to our uh, national Eden page and um, go to topics and you'll get to topics, hazards and threats, and drought. There are 25 state extension drought websites. So not only do we have drought information on a national site, you can uh, go down to each state level and find a good deal of resources on drought, which I, I know is important in this group. I'm going to wind up the last few minutes here talking about some very specific uh, offerings. And, and the, the thing in front of us right now is the community capacity building program for drought response. It's a new guide for communities fighting drought. And um, I do have to say that uh, unprompted from me, 
the Department of Ag person from Mexico State said that, uh, told the, the White House roundtable that this is one resource that works. And um, I'm going to go through the slides, which will illustrate some of the things that it can do. So the goal of this is to get communities to work together across agencies and organizations with a wide, uh, community-wide resolve to build the capacity to survive and possibly thrive in the current and future drought situations. Um, this work will influence the local FERA. I'm sure everyone here knows what that is, but I um, noted it down below, threat hazard identification risk assessment, and that will feed the state FERA. This, these are actual findings in our pilots. It raised awareness of the importance of water, which just kills me when I've gone out to California in uh, 12, 13, and 14, how many people didn't realize that their state water supply was so critical. Um, it po po the, uh, the guide helped pollinate related community discussions. Uh, the results can be used in other projects and grant proposals. In fact, even right now, so we're taking a look at this guide and we're going to convert it to uh, see how we can work with uh, water-related disasters, uh, flooding, uh, tsunamis, and even uh, straight-line winds uh, kind of damage. Uh, it helped identify, record, and map locations for water distribution setup. And this was all done because of setting up a community program to take a look at these issues and help can help in the development of uh, memorandums on understanding. Uh, for, and this is actually done in Socorro County, New Mexico, and it helped them collaborate with the state engineer because they had more specific um, guidelines, monitoring off aquifers, uh, water quality monitoring. And in New Mexico, it helped determine the need for desalination pumps, identify resources for future water, uh, future needs, Publication on uh, public education on water and explore watershed health programs. And uh, it led to voluntary home water usage audits, creating a water conservation plan, educate and plan for agricultural producers. I think this is the last mitigation findings. Determine the trigger points in a drought is something that. Uh, the drought early warning system is also addressing education on fire restrictions, create uh, water storage, uh, help them figure out what to do with gray water. And don't ask me the answer to that because I, I don't remember, but they, but they came up with something. Wildlife water usage, foliage along waterways, and home and landowner water usage. I think that's the last slide on mitigation. So you can see from those slides that this, this drought uh, capacity building guide is very useful. It's very difficult to use. It's difficult to get enough people to come together. And uh, in the guide, it shows what expertise areas you should pull together. Um, no community can ever get all the experts that they have there, but at least the leaders are aware if they have gaps where they can go to find other information. Okay. Uh, we also have. Uh, what's been a very successful first steps to flood recovery. You see the URL there. You can go there, and any of the information on this is free for your your use. Uh, uh, we also offer states the ability to adapt this to state by bringing their institution name on it. Uh, this has been so successful, more than counting up, more than 80,000 of these publications have been distributed, and mostly right after a flood. Um, in, in Indiana, American Red Cross uses this as the first publication that they give to someone when they set up a shelter. Uh, unfortunately, this publication, when a disaster happens, has a very sh short shelf life. Uh, I'd say about four days max, or at least uh, it should be distributed before the person returns to their home, because it's got a lot of useful information for them to do. This might be of special interest to you folks. It's uh, planned today for tomorrow's flood. And it has um, it has two parts. The first half of the book talks about how to put together a plan for a flood and, and how to get your 
farm or your agribusiness set up so you're better prepared for a flood and you're anticipating some of the things that might happen. And, it, and then it also has how to respond to a flood. And it's a very good publication. Uh, it's, it's available from uh, the education store. And the URL is kind of long, but it's there. Uh, if you can't find it, please send me an email and I'll direct you to it if you're interested. I guess that is the last of my slides. About seven minutes early, um, and I'll be uh, ready to take questions. Great, Steve. Thank you so much. Um, I know I learned a lot, and so and I see we've got a couple of familiar um, folks uh, participating with us. So we'll go ahead right now and, and take questions from the group. So you can either uh, again you can either put them in the chat box, or I think um, you ought to be able to use your microphone and just uh, there should be you should be able to see a talk button uh, on the left hand side of your screen, uh, just below uh, as part of the audio video module in the in the upper left of your screen. Okay, we have a question from Terry. What resources are available for working with teachers and students? Well, um, actually, that Ready Business course that I mentioned, uh, and that's a very good question. And uh, But that Ready Business course is set up to work in fact, all of those, uh, if I can go back to that slide real quick, are set up so that you can use them in the classroom. Um, do as I as I mentioned uh, there we go and I'll move this back to the last slide when we're done here. Uh, in fact, many junior colleges have used the Ready Business in their in their courses, and it's available for free. You download it and incorporate it in. I think the Animal Agro Security and the Plant Biosecurity and the On Guard would also be good resources to use in the classroom to teach uh, students about animal how animal emergency management works, how plant biosecurity management works, and then um, how protecting our food works. Um, and, and I point those out because those might be most related to uh, water-related issues. Um, and as I said, we are most we are extension, but this year we um, added research as a topic area at our annual meeting. Some of the folks that work with us are academic, and they do have programs. I know Ohio State does. Um, I think it was Oregon State has a program teaching children how to be better prepared for disaster. It's also a zombie program. So the, that's the long windy answer. But the short answer is we have not, as eating, done much as a national group to help you, but I know that if uh, someone was looking for a specific resource to use uh, in the classroom and we filtered that question out to our 270 delegates, we would probably come up with a resource. And the second part of that is specifically the uh, community preparedness curriculum for low grades 4 through 12. We do not. Um, ours is mostly aimed at um, adult education or kind of 4-H education on the community community preparedness. It's it's mostly adult education. Now FEMA, on the other hand, uh, I'm on their national preparedness group, and I can take that question to them and, and give back to you. So um, if you want me to follow up on that, I'm going to make sure that I have my information in here, but Here's my email address, and I am pretty sure FEMA nationally has some curriculum on that that can be used for um, grades 4 through 12. Thank you. Okay, other questions from the group? In fact, I'm going to be speaking with, um, I'm actually speaking kind of like this on FEMA's individual and public preparedness regionals uh, 
a meeting of all the regional directors, and I can bring that up tomorrow. So we'll see what happens. Well, Steve, I, I have a question. Uh, so as you know, there are folks that work in wa on water-related issues and extension, um, a diversity of water-related issues. Some of those are disaster related and, and some of them are not, or um, some of them might be considered, um, you know, uh, planning or, you know, uh, early preparedness, you know, very early, like, uh, you know, soil health to mitigate drought and flooding risk. It's, you know, promoting soil health isn't something we would typically think of as, as disaster response certainly or even disaster planning that might not be the first thing that comes to mind but I'm wondering so as you think about Eden and Eden's role in water related issues you know um, it, have you had any early thoughts about you know how you know how the North Central Region Water Network and Eden can can parse um, how, you know how we cover water issues as extension mm -hmm. I can think of a lot of ways, and, and i got to give you my bias. Um, at least in Indiana, we've made a whole lot of poor decisions about water management from rural to uh, urban. And um, in, in fact, this is not agricultural, but we, we shouldn't even have any basements in northern Indiana. And probably 90% of our flooding is basements in Indiana. And so, you know that's a that's that's a land use planning issue, but but also expansion of, of urban areas. Kokomo, Indiana, has had three floods in four years, and they've got a whole lot of concrete without a whole lot of water holding areas. Um, I go from that to all the way to the other end of the extreme. Uh, there have been some projects taking a look at holding uh, using the tile systems in the winter. To hold some water in the in the field and releasing it slowly so that it doesn't flood. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, and and you know I, I work with people like Jane Frankenberger who might be part of the group or not I don't know. Uh, and some of the Sea Grant people here at uh, Purdue in Illinois and they're kind of the experts for me that I go to 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 find out the answers. But I guess all I can say is let's work together. Let's figure out what this change all means and what resources we have that can help us get at an answer like that. Am I helping? I think so. One of the things I'm hearing is, you know, if we look at a given disaster, uh, in some cases there are upstream things, so, so to speak, that could be done to. Uh, to mitigate, reduce, eliminate the negative impact, and and maybe in this process, Eden is a little bit more downstream, you know, and and the network uh, can operate more more upstream in some cases if that, that makes sense. Um, and that it, you know, we probably need to take a look at this on a, a case by case basis. Is that? Yep. Yep. Please. Okay. Perfect. Um, we have a question from Laura, and Laura, I'm so glad you joined us. She's asking if uh, you've worked with state climatologists at all. Uh, you can see her question there about uh, the state climatologists being on uh, state drought task forces, other natural hazard management groups, um, and some of them aren't extension employees, although some of them, like Laura, do have extension appointments. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and I, I guess I should say this, while Eden has a national presence, Eden is no better than we are in each of our 50 states and three territories. So, so Lord, the answer to your question is state by state, and we work very closely with our state climatologist uh, here in Indiana. Um, we would like to do more uh, outreach programs with them, uh, and especially I see it as we get our uh, community organizations active in disaster born, we will have uh, a hungry bunch of people wanting information and education. There's a classic example working 
uh, with the state climatologists to help them make more informed decisions at the community level, which will impact agriculture and the urban area. Um, I am working with state climatologists uh, group here at Purdue. We are uh, we're working on a project. Hope to have it done by next summer that will help volunteers who are working with a large group of kids in one situation go from the process of here's the weather outlook and what are the decisions and why is that important? What are the decisions you should be making if you have an upcoming meeting with a lot of kids and few adults? to when you get right down to the, the, the warning and the watch and the event and the post event, what do you do with this group of kids uh, when you're just a handful of adults working with these? So that's a, that's a resource that's coming up because of the uh, partnership with state climatologists and extension. Thanks, Steve. This is Laura. <laughs> and I have another question, too. If you partnered with the National Drought Mitigation Center at University of Nebraska at all? Yes. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, I, I saw you in that community's drought response um, resource. And I know they have a drought ready community uh, workbook or, you know, program as well that they've developed. And it sounds like there's a lot of similarities between what they're trying to do and what you're doing. It, it is, and we actually use that as a resource to put ours together with their blessings. We also use the Sea Grants Resilient Community Program. Uh, it's primarily a southern uh, effort, and uh, some of those tools went into in this guide. And um, yeah, we work closely with uh, the, the National Development Mitigation Center. In fact. In 2000, late 2012 through 2013, Brian Fuchs helped us put on a, a webinar monthly that was used by the National Board. And the National Board is voluntary organizations active in disaster, and they were looking for ways in which they could help uh, all communities and even agricultural communities respond to that drought. So, um, yeah, great resource. Steve, I, I was trying to uh, multitask and uh, access that uh, community uh, drought preparedness publication, and I, I didn't. It it directed me to the Eden State Points of Contact for Wisconsin, um, which I'm happy to call Cheryl, of course. But is there a way that is mm -hmm. is that the best way to get a look at that resource? Um, probably not. Uh, let me back up here a little bit. And I apologize for not putting the, the short URL in here, but if you go to our national page, and it's a, it's a simple URL, there we go, and I should have put the URL in here, it's eden.lsu.edu. LSU is Louisiana State University, and you all know .edu, so eden lsu.edu um, and if you go to if you look in the middle of this screen you see home topics eating courses etc it's a it's a white line it starts out black about one third of the way down if you hit the eating courses button there it will take you to all of our eating courses including this community capacity building guide and you will have to register to download the materials and the only thing we use that for is when we update materials, we want to let you know that we've done a revision or an update. It should be pretty easy to get to from there. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll take a look. Can you say more about uh, the uh, your current partners? Um, you know, that group list group of partners that you listed. Are most of those funding partners, or are they partners of various sorts? <laughs> the, um, uh, the only funding partner at this moment is um, is National NEFA. We did get a grant from FEMA several years ago, and uh, the, um, the southern region of Extension got that grant, and they put together a program called Ready Communities. It's quite an extensive program, but it's also very good. 
But other than that, we have not received any funding outside of NEPA for national efforts. Now, individuals in each state can get grants. And that reminds me, I'm glad you asked the question that way. Uh, USDA NEPA has a special needs grant. And if you Google USDA NEPA special needs, you'll find out more about that grant. And individual universities can team up with other partners and submit for that grant. It's every year. I think the deadline is in June. And those grants have been anywhere from a ten or $15,000 planning grant up to a $150,000 working grant. And there are some tools, and I, I, uh, tools that have been developed for even through that. I can't go through all those right now, but I think we used it to enhance the SCAP program I talked about. Uh, one of the issues, the, the, I mean, the two issues of that grant is that the submitting institution has to match 100% of the cost. But that institution has to show how it will help across state lines. And um, Mississippi State University got one of those grants last year. And what they're doing is they're taking a, a youth preparedness program and they're uh, adding to it. And they're using the money to take it nationally. So the money can be all sent to one institution, which is important for that match. But the institution just has to figure out how to get that product out nationally. And that's a simple solution in some cases, is develop the product, work with us to brand it, your institution, and eat it, and put it on the national Eden website. And, and so um, in terms of the partnership, that's, that's a grant that's been underutilized in not last year, but some years they've, had, they've not had uh, a lot of competition for the grant. We, we, I mentioned the Foundation for Food and Ag Research. Research. They have sent out a call for proposal for $120,000 um, to, to take a look at ways of improving how we gather research in a agricultural biological event that could be water related, it could be drought related. Um, who else? All the others have just been partnerships on sharing information. We work very close to the team as. Uh, community preparedness group to, to get information across. And then we also work very close to the FEMA when they come into a state. Um, I see a comment in, scroll down a little. in New Mexico, there is so little buffer between plentiful water and drought. Awareness is stronger than in other states. Yes. yes. Um, and, and specifically in the county that they did it in, uh, Socorro County in New Mexico, they, they, that's where they did their pilot of this program. And, um, you know, they're, they're so up and down. I think I heard that they're in a good water situation this year. But, um, and I think the other thing that happened in New Mexico is that their New Mexico Department of Homeland Security really gets the importance of agriculture and I'm a little jealous. I think we put a lot of money into disaster preparedness. Yeah. Snowfall in the mountains. I think that's for uh, true for California too, so I understand the reserves. Other questions or comments? Other questions from the group? Okay, well, Steve, this has been really, really helpful. And um, I, one of the things that occurs to me is it would be useful to have you uh, on a, a North Central Region Water Network leadership team call to, you know, talk in some more specifics about opportunities. So we have the, the North Central Region Water Network has a, um, we don't call our folks delegates, we call them state points of contact. But they're, you know, they're essentially the, um, the same thing, except I think you sometimes have more delegates. We have uh, two is the maximum that we have uh, in, in water. But just to get together with that smaller smaller group, and th so those people are, are supposed to be nodes in our network, you know, that help to um, translate, you know, uh, uh, 
communicate multi-state issues and resources down back into their states and then communicate state needs, you know, up into a multi-state framework or help us find the right people in their states, you know, with particular expertise. Um, if someone, you know, someone from Wisconsin is looking for someone that has uh, climate and extension expertise, I would say call Laura Edwards. She knows, the, you know, she, she's the one to, to talk to you about that. Um, so anyway, th those people might be good to hash through some more specifics about how, how we might approach this. Yeah, and, and if you're looking for uh, an expert outside of your state, even even network may be able to help with that. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yep. Uh, and I, it's one of the things that's exciting to me is looking at that whole, you know, being able to link up some of our expertise. Again, as I said, that's more up upstream of the disaster itself with with some of the things that you do in more of the emergency uh, planning and response. Um, you know, so we can have this whole nice chain of education and communication um, on a particular issue. Uh, it just seems like there's lots of opportunities there. Okay, well, and as you said, uh, you know, I, so I, uh, I certainly would expect that we'll have more people taking a look at this uh, online. Um, we had a relatively short lead time on this one, and we really appreciate your time, and I know this is going to be the start of some, some great uh, additional extension programs. So this webinar will be up um, in a week or so, uh, and I'll just go to our final slides here. So here's Steve's uh, contact information, which I think he also put in the chat box. And then, um, uh, yeah, we will have this webinar up at, at northcentralwater.org and also on e-extensions, um, on e-extension. E and our, uh, we, we do these webinars monthly, so the up, our upcoming webinar session on November 16th, uh, same time, 2 p.m. Central Time, will be land use of riparian ecosystems in the Northern Great Plains, resources for extension and adult education. And uh, Miranda Meehan uh, has been leading a project for us, uh, and they have some great educational resources that they've developed for extension educators and other, other educators. So uh, we'll learn more about that on November 16th. So thanks again, Steve, and uh, uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll certainly be in touch soon to talk about next steps.